It all starts with a vision, the foresight to see the possibilities ahead, and the brilliant ingenuity to bring it to life, and the skill to make the impossible possible. It is understanding your role and using it to shape the way forward. It is to recognize the freedom of creativity. It's having the ability to be bold, yet stay relevant through the years by creating forms that are meaningful and lasting. Built to beautify your life. Built for you to thrive. It is this spirit of perfection and wanting better that fuels our purpose at Nations Trust Bank. A philosophy that drives us to be more than a bank and recognize our ability to shape lives present and future by building relationships that endure. Shaped the right way. Shaped for better. Nations Trust Bank. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, I was born in the coastal town of Nigambo. Nigambo is famous for shrimps, prawns, and crabs. You know the difference between prawns and crabs? I'm sorry, prawns and shrimps. Shrimps are denizens on the, of the brackish waters and marine environment, but prawns are from freshwater environment. Nigambu Lagoon, rather an estuary, is endowed with diverse vegetation, mangroves, mangrove associates, <coughs> and fauna adapted to the unique brackish water habitat. Uh, the main characteristic features of this habitat is the diurnal and also the seasonal variation in salinity. Usually, in the marine environment, salinity is around 35 parts per thousand, but in the freshwater environment, it's less than 0.5 parts per thousand, but in the brackish water environment, it varies between 0.5 and 35. <coughs> As children, my brother and I used to go to the Munakere Bridge and look down at the Nigambu Lagoon. We would admire the ebb and flow of the water in the lagoon caused by the high and low tides from the bridge. The livelihood of many of the residents was closely intervened with the unique habitat. It was integrated with this unique habitat. As my brother and I, yeah, <laughs> Work through, walk through the mangroves and mudflats, we would often come across women extracting fine sea salt using the sediments of the Nigambu Lagoon. This was one of the cottage industries that was popular in the area, in addition to the preparation of dried fish and jari. Years later, my background growing up in the heart of this lagoon inspired me to convince the Nara authorities to establish the Kadol Kale Mangrove Research Center in Nigambu. At the time, this land was earmarked by political authorities to develop a stadium and a housing complex, clearing the mangrove areas, uh, causing irreversible damage. In the late 90s, I used to travel in an outrigger canoe 
from Moratu Old Bridge to the Panadura River mouth along the estuary twice a month for nearly two years. This was to collect samples for my research on estuarine biology, which led to an amphilin marine biology. On these many trips, I had the unique opportunity to observe the constant changes in the estuary and its habitats. Sadly, I often witness mass destruction of habitats along either side of the estuary. I had an opportunity to visit almost all the wetlands in the southern, southwestern, western and northwestern provinces to assess suitable land areas for swim culture when I was at Nara. This project was sponsored by NDB and EDB. Impacts of reclamation of coastal acid soils was my research topic for PhD. Right. The wetlands What's the definition? Wetlands are the areas of land that is permanently or seasonally get inundated with fresh, brackish or saline water. Comprise a diverse range of plant and animal species that are adapted to the degree of inundation and also to the type of water that is present and also to the type of sediments or soil conditions. There are a large number of wetland uh, ecological functions and human use values. Those are flood storage, flood retention, sediment control, water quality improvement, uh, preventing shoreline erosion and protection, providing habitats for plants, fish and wildlife, providing habitats for endangered animals, acting as biodiversity reservoirs, provide critical wildlife habitats, serve as breeding, nursery and feeding grounds for aquatic organisms, help to control life cycles of commercially important fish, shrimp and crab species, blood protection, storm protection, filtration of contamination, contaminants and sediments, nutrient transformation, nutrient removal and storage, non-consumptive uh, uh, recreation, and commercial fishery, and also uh, aquaculture. Most of the threatened wetlands in Sri Lanka if we, uh, uh, are the coastal wetlands with mangroves, mangrove associates, salt marshes, mud flats, seagrass beds. Those are the most threatened wetlands areas in Sri Lanka. That is mainly due to the high demand for land. Uh, for urbanization, the uh, agriculture, they have converted a lot of land for agriculture, tourism, uh, uh, they have established industrial zones in those areas, development of saltans, village expansion, developments related to renewable energy, other industrial development, garbage disposal, both uh, industrial and domestic, and uh, for aquaculture. These are the mangroves and salt species common in northwestern province. So we had a maritima and mud flats. Uh, <coughs> this slide shows the natural settings of coastal environment. Uh, you can see the estuary or the lagoon proper, mangroves on either sides, salt marshes, and the areas developed for agriculture, 
but I have not included the areas include uh, uh, areas developed for agriculture in these sites. But you may observe uh, something special here. There's a pyritic layer insulated under the superficial layer of sediments, pyritic layer. So in most of our wetlands, especially in the northern, uh, in the western, northwestern provinces, this layer is there, the pyritic layer. So upon reclamation, this little technical, we uh, have the, this particular environment has organic matter from mangroves, sulfates from brackish or seawater, and also iron from sediments. These iron come from the rivers that flow into the coastal areas. And uh, all these things, the iron three oxides from the sediments, sulfate ions from the seawater, organic matter, and dissolved oxygen facilitate the formation of pyrite, that is iron sulfide. So what happens once you reclaim those land, you remove the surface layer and the pyrite layer get exposed. The iron sulfide get oxidized and get the formation of hydrated oxides of iron plus sulfuric acid. So once you reclaim those areas, those areas become acidic. There are several environmental impacts identified <coughs> those are the environmental impacts there are two uh, categories short term and long term short term effects include fish diseases mass mortalities of microscopic organisms increased light penetration due to water clarity, fish kills, loss of acid sent to crustaceans, and destruction of fish eggs. Usually, uh, there are several records of mass mortality during rainy periods after prolonged dry spells. So, in areas where acid soils are reclaimed. So during the dry weather condition, the iron get oxidized, you get the formation of sulfuric acid with the rains, that acid get washed into the lagoon or to the water body, causing uh, mass mortalities during rainy periods after prolonged dry spells. Then we had a disease called EUS, episodic ulcerative syndrome, um, several decades back, even uh, I think 10, 20, uh, 10 to 15 years back also, we had this. And this uh, <coughs> disease is common in areas with acid sulfate soil areas. And when these lands are reclaimed gradually, only the acid tolerant plants can survive. And uh, you can observe this phenomena in Muthurajaval and Nigambu Lagoon area, this particular Nympia species uh, called Telolu in Singhala is dominating some of the water bodies. Then the other problem, the hydrated 
iron oxides are uh, insoluble so you get persistent iron coatings uh, in those areas among plants there are several long term effects i'll concentrate only on the most important effects persistent iron coating uh, loss of habitat invasion of uh, acid tolerant water plants in muthurajavel i told that the nymphia species is prevailing and the reduced spawning success due to stress then the you get the formation of chemical migration barriers and reduced food resources will be there then the dominance of acid tolerant plankton species there will be growth abnormalities of the uh, animal and plants reduced growth rates increased predation changes in food chains and webs and reduce recruitment and also increase in toxic elements because the sulfuric acid uh, can dissolve the iron aluminum copper the things in the uh, environment the in the acid soils so the content of iron aluminum is relatively high in those environments where acid soils are reclaimed for various activities then we'll move to aquaculture <coughs> it is an industry that en uh, encompasses the cultivation of aquatic plants and animals in control systems may be for commercial purposes may be for recreation or even for resource management purposes aquaculture has a history over 2500 years aquaculture was practiced as an art but now it has transformed to a science so this transformation led to rapid expansion in aquaculture activity and aquaculture is one of the major food production sectors annual growth rate was around 8% in the last two decades this is perhaps the fastest growing primary production sector currently aquaculture accounts for around 50% of the global food fish consumption total world fish production capture plus aquaculture is expected to reach 201 million tons in 2030 the major growth in production is expected to originate from aquaculture which is projected to reach 109 million tons in uh, 2030 you can see the uh, trends in uh, global culture fisheries and aquaculture production so Uh, the world uh, capture fisheries production has got stagnated we have reached the maximum sustainable limits uh, for uh, capture fishery but any further increase in the fish production has to come from aquaculture now it has exceeded 50% and we are expecting by 20 Uh, there's a uh, further uh, increase by 
uh, our the commercial type of aquaculture is mainly in the uh, coastal aquaculture sector we use estuaries lagoons and also the coastal lands around those water bodies for aquaculture the estuaries as you all know are the coastal bodies of water within which the sea water get measurably diluted with the fresh water derived from the land drainage so you have to have all those three requirements there has to be a coastal body of water there has to be a, 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 a appreciable amount of mixing and uh, with the from fresh water and fresh water has to be derived from the land drainage La uh, there are several land based aquaculture systems and water based aquaculture systems once you develop you can have land based systems and also you can have uh, water based aquaculture systems for example if you are growing seaweed most of the systems are developed for water based polythyroids water based but shrimp and fish mostly are on coastal uh, land at the moment there are several provinces engaged in coastal aquaculture those provinces are north western province northern province and also the eastern province so there is a development proposed in northern province they have initiated some aquaculture activities in the northern province they want to grow sea cucumber seaweed shrimps and other fish species in the northern province but we had our aquaculture activities for at least last three decades in the north western province these are the main species of seaweed we are growing uh, glaceraria species and cephophyga species out of these two the cephophyga uh, is a introduced species from korea so most of the commercial uh, activities are concentrated towards growing these exotic variety cephophyga still we don't know the impacts of those introductions then the holothuroids that is sea cucumber we are growing our native varieties in pens in uh, lagoons and estuarine waters well coastal aquaculture and uh, sustainable development goals coastal aquaculture can contribute towards achieving several sustainable development goals and hunger achieving food security improving nutrition and poverty ensuring healthy lives promoting inclusive and sustainable growth ensuring sustainable consumption and production and also will promote the sustainable use of coastal and marine resources aquaculture sustainability depends on three main areas one environmental sustainability that is should not create significant disruption to the ecosystems or cause the loss of biodiversity or sustainable 
well, pollution impact. Second, economic sustainability. Aquaculture must be a viable business with uh, long-term prospect. Then the social and community sustainability. Aquaculture must be socially responsible and contribute to community well-being. Uh, NAGDA is the agency that is responsible for the development of aquaculture. They are concerned with two areas. One is uh, freshwater aquaculture and the coastal aquaculture. The shrimp culture, shrimp is the key species. The targeted production in Sri Lanka by 2025 is 48,000 metric tons. We have recently introduced Vaname without proper risk assessment. So they expect uh, 37,600 37, metric tons from Vaname and from our native species, P. monodon, 10,000. 400 metric tons. As you all know, we initiated shrimp culture in northwestern province. And what went wrong? There was a rapid, uncontrolled expansion in the industry. When we classify the zones for coastal aquaculture development, there are several categories. There are no-go zones, there are high-risk zones, there are medium-risk zones, and low-risk zones. But there are no no-risk zones. There has to be some sort of risk. So, after each election, although the NARA has tried to uh, control the development, NARA has identified sensitive areas, but after each election, there was a rapid expansion. So that was the main cause, that was one of the main cause for rapid uh, destruction. Then, the self-pollution. The uh, shrimp farming industry is a self-polluting industry. They discharge high concentration of nutrients, uh, nitrides, nitrates, ammonia, that is toxic metabolic end products, total suspended solids, high concentrations. So all those products will pollute the environment the shrimp farms depend on. That's called self-pollution. So self-pollution was one of the area that contribute towards the reduction in environmental capacity. Then the sandbar formation. So you should have seen this phenomena in our coastal areas, most of the river mouths, you can observe this phenomena of sandbar formation. Sometimes the river mouth get completely cut off from the sandbar. So the sandbar formation at outfalls have several uh, adverse impacts. Reduction in tidal movements, reduction water exchange or tidal flushing within the estuary, prevent dilution of pollutants from seawater, promote accumulation of pollutants within the estuary. If it's in a dry zone, when the sandbar get formed, the salinity inside the lagoon will get uh, build up. But in wet zone, once the uh, sandbar is there, water become more and more 
fresh and <coughs> increase the resident time of the estuarine waters. So the pollutants can't get out, uh, get out from the system when the sandbar formation. So sandbar formation is also contributing towards the reduction in environmental capacity in the northwestern province. Then I have told this phenomena that is the utilization of acid sulfate soils, especially in the northwestern province, especially in the Chilau area along the Dutch Canal, the soils are acidic. You get the pyritic layer underneath the surface layer. So once they construct the shrimp farms, they remove the surface layer, exposing the pyritic soil layer, which upon oxidation, you get the formation of sulfuric acid and hydrated iron oxides. So that is, <coughs> so what happens, even the shrimps grown in acid sulfate soils, when the hydrated oxides are in water, once they respire, these acids get plugged in between the lamellae. So the oxygen supply uh, to shrimp will go down and the other uh, animals become weak. So these are the sort of uh, SCM photographs of the gills and these gills have got clogged with hydrated oxides of iron. I mean, they become lethargic and Finally, uh, uh, they die. Then the next interesting phenomena is uh, in the northwestern province, due to the uh, I mean shrimp farming, there was an increase in pathogens and carrier populations in the environment. There were several exotic or the uh, uh, pathogens get, uh, got into Sri Lanka. What is, one is uh, monodon vacuolar virus, then the white spot virus. So those viruses were not found in Sri Lanka, but with the introduction of stream farming, those viruses got into our environment as new pathogen. Then there were several uh, disease outbreaks uh, in a few, uh, say, one was in 1996, and uh, that we had the white spot virus, so it completely destroyed the shrimp production during that period. And there are also, in the environment, different types of bacteria in the environment. There are three different categories. Some are beneficial bacteria, some are harmful bacteria, and they are obligate parasites. They are very dangerous. And some are potentially harmful, but they are opportunistic. If they get an opportunity, only they can invade and uh, uh, cause mortalities. So now we are used to use probiotics in shrimp farming. That is to uh, suspend or to cut down the pro uh, population of those opportunistic and harmful bacteria and to promote the uh, beneficial bacteria in the environment. Then uh, you should have heard uh, a, a 70 to 80 percent of the shrimp farming developments in early stages were on mangroves, salt marshes, and on mudflats. 
more than 70% of the development. But there's a new concept. So that was one of the reasons for the uh, uh, reduction in environmental capacity. The next is the siltation of water bodies due to the suspended solids released from the shrimp farms. Uh, discharge from the discharges from the farms uh, influence they are with very high concentrations of sulfate uh, suspended solids so disposal of sediments accumulated in the ponds during the culture they release to the environment so they have uh, dinara has done several bathymetric surveys and they have found significant reduction in water area in the Mundal Lagoon and also there's a significant reduction in the average depth of the Mundal Lagoon due to siltation and the siltation particles are from the shrimp farms. Then we look at the present uh, situation of shrimp production in Sri Lanka. This is the shrimp production, export amount, and uh, export income. Right? The graph you can see an increase after 2000. Uh, I'm very, uh, the recently. The total production has gone up. 2020, yes. That is due to the introduction of P Vaname. So it has gone up. Now what's happening? Again, there are disease problems emerging, and in next few years it will come down. Now it has reached the sort of maximum like uh, level S. So, uh, uh, recently uh, we were involved in a study sponsored by World Bank to estimate the carrying capacities of the environment for aquaculture. So, we uh, they wanted to start it at uh, in, it in the northern province because uh, I mean, the demand is very high for Northern Province at the moment. So the carrying capacity is the, I'm more comfortable here. <laughs> carrying capacity is the total production, which can be supported by a defined area, ecosystem, or by a particular section of a coastline. Environmental capacity is a property of the environment and its ability to accommodate a particular level of activity with an acceptable level of impact. If the capacity is exceeded, water quality declines, disease organisms will thrive, and aquaculture production may decline or collapse. Services offered by the ecosystem may also collapse carrying capacity determination in aquaculture depends on both environmental capacity and the rate of waste production from aquaculture. In fed aquaculture systems, that is most of the aquaculture systems, you have to provide artificial feed. The concept can be this carrying capacity concept can be used to estimate maximum area <clears throat> under culture or sustainable production levels from a defined area without or minimal environmental degradation. So, I mean, it's very difficult to have uh, developments without, at least without minimal environmental degradation. So under the World Bank project, we were able to develop a software 
based on the nitrogen balance to estimate the carrying capacities of several water bodies. So we can use this software in future to estimate the capacities. Uh, we have identified several inputs. Once you feed those inputs, you'll get the outputs. So this is a little complicated. So I don't want to sort of, uh, because that will need some time. I'll just show you the software. And uh, so using this, it's not clear. But uh, I mean, uh, this software, you'll be able to go for the, uh, we estimate the carrying capacity. So finally, other interventions to enhance or the maintenance of the carrying capacity of the aquaculture environment. So there are several things you can do either to maintain the existing level or to improve the carrying capacity of the environment. That is decreasing the waste production for kilogram of fish or shellfish produce. So there are technical improvements you can do to decrease the waste produced per kilogram of uh, fish, shellfish or uh, crab produce. Then the reducing the amount of waste that is discharged to the environment. You can reduce the amount of waste. You can recirculate your water. You can treat your water uh, to minimize the uh, release of nutrient into the environment. Then the proper sludge management in farms, especially sludge, once you uh, rem uh, send to the environment, it will uh, promote towards the uh, 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 siltation of water bodies. Then the use of uh, uh, treatment, sorry, treatment of wastewater and recycling within the farm. That is also possible. You recirculate your water, uh, you'll have a sedimentation tank or water treatment tanks. You can treat water and reuse. Then the use of probiotics. I introduced that concept. There are some beneficial bacteria, harmful bacteria and opportunistic bacteria. So you can uh, increase the number of uh, useful bacteria by using probiotics. Then the maintenance or improving the capacity of the environment to assimilate waste. So if you have more mangroves, more salt marshes, so those environments can assimilate, absorb, uh, waste. So increasing the mangrove coverage, salt marsh coverage, you can improve the carrying capacity of the environment. Then the introduction of integrated multitrophic aquaculture systems, which are called IMTA, this uh, activity like polyculture. You have several organisms in the same aquaculture system. Say for example, the nutrients released by shrimps, if you have uh, seaweed in the system, they'll absorb and improve the environment. So you can, there are several small ecological niches, niches within the system. So you can address uh, the uh, sort of uh, canning capacity uh, issues by uh, integrating several species in one system. Then the estimate of environmental quality standards. Still, we don't have environmental quality standards for aquaculture waters. So we have to uh, develop that and also standards for effluent discharges. But we have uh, standards for industrial effluent discharge, but we have to have for the aquaculture water bodies, uh, this uh, uh, effluent standards separately. 
then the adoption of better management practices, good farming practices and biosecurity measures will also help to improve the capacity of the environment. And finally, use of recirculation systems, uh, recirculation aquaculture systems, this is one of the uh, developing system uh, you'll be able to, um, and we'll be able to use in future. So I'll expand on the last two. Then the ben uh, better management practices. If you use better management practices, you can uh, increase farm performance. The total production growth rates you can improve. Then improve the quality of the product uh, if you use bio, uh, better management practices. Then reduce adverse environmental impacts. Enhance environmental capacity. Minimize socio-political conflicts build investor confidence because at one stage all the financing institutions uh, refused to finance uh, stream farming uh, even the aquaculture activities that is after those uh, disease outbreaks then the build you can build con confidence uh, financing uh, of financing is institutions by using better management practices when we were working at NARA, the Ceylon Bank wants to refinance the uh, shrimp farmers. So we developed a scheme of better management practices. And if you practice those, if you prove that you are practicing those, only you get the uh, monthly loan installment. So that all sort of activities. Then, uh, promote responsible and sustainable aquaculture by uh, going through, uh, I mean, by adopting better management practices. Even uh, these BMPs are there to combat climate change impacts. And also BMPs will address the biosecurity issues. So we were talking about the RAs, recirculation aquaculture systems. There are several advantages of recirculation uh, systems. Uh, in those systems, there are some very strict controls uh, operational in RAs to manage solid waste. Solid waste generation in the RAs are extremely low as the solid waste are well managed in RAs systems. Discharge of water from RAs is very minimal only to replenishment, they need extra water. And they have several systems to remove the suspended solid particles of different types, uh, different sizes generated in the system. So they have uh, on ozonation process and also they have biological filters. The flow diagram is indicated there uh, they have these large tanks with spiral water movement that uh, 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 will uh, allow the uh, settlement of larger particles. Then the rotary drum filter, uh, protein schema that is for the suspended very small particles and ozonation is their ozone generator. So in this process, you get very clean water and the amount that they discharge is very minimal. So in recent past, uh, they have coupled the system with aquaponics. The nutrients going out, they use for aquaponics. And there's a such system in uh, Madurankuli area, not Madurankuli, Bangadeni area, more towards the inward, uh, this thing. And those are the expected advantages, but disadvantages are the, the I mean, it's a I'm very costly system. And also the energy use is high. And only you can use these for the uh, systems 
where they are producing high-valued fish shrimp species. Uh, well, uh, the solid waste uh, problem is addressed in this RAs. They have settleable uh, solids where there are tanks with spiral water movement. So helps to settle large particles over 100 micron. Then the rotary drum filter will address the problem of 1 to 100 micron particles. Then protein skimmer, uh, especially they remove the colloidal particles in the system. And total suspended soil contains a large fraction of organic material that is measured as volatile suspended solids. So all these systems are in operation in RAs and will help to sort of minimize the environmental degradation from all this thing. So since we don't actually, uh, when we consider the land use and the uh, uh, problems related to land issues, we have to go for a, an in future uh, system of this type where the production is very high, the environment problems are minimal, and but also the, but the on the other hand, the cost of uh, the system and the maintenance cost is high. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may I take this opportunity to thank uh, 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 for providing me uh, a chance to share the experience with you all. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm happy to open the forum for questions. Should anyone want to ask Professor anything that he would like to clarify? Anything that you'd like to clarify? I know it's a a rather specialist area, but uh, nonetheless extremely important. So anything a little more general on this area, if you'd like to clarify, I'm happy to do so. Hundred and twenty days because they expect them to grow up to thirty five grams. Yes, but now what has happened? Those people stock the ponds in very high density and they go for partial harvest and they remove twenty grams, fifteen grams, depending on the market demand. But initially, they go for very high stocking density, but that density is not recommended by NAGDA. You mentioned about the sulfate blooms in wetlands. Uh, do you have any ideas on uh, like controlling measures? Uh, what are the control measures of uh, con yeah, acid soil? Yeah. There are 14 measures identified. I'll just talk about a few measures but repeated drying and flushing. You allow the uh, pond to dry and you flush it. So repeated drying and flushing is the easiest way. You can use lime to neutralize. And even for the pond bottom, you can use uh, 
something like chicken manure and fertilix that is the uh, especially in philippines once you take out the juice from uh, sugar cane the remaining part so it make it a uh, sort of permeability down then if you have vegetation on dikes that also prevent the exposure of the acid soils in the buns right and uh, when you are stocking you have to go for relatively larger size that is one aspect so the if you build your pond i mean relatively la larger ponds effect will be minimal there are 14 ways that was my phd problem uh, the reclamation of acid soils so, right. so is it applicable for the natural uh, ecosystems like natural yes that repeated flushing and, yeah yeah that's why and the, having the vegetation cover soon after the reclamation if you have the vegetation cover and uh, you can prevent the further oxidation thank you Because yeah, we have sorry. the sort of uh, conducive condition for the acid soil formation. The iron comes from the, I mean, through the sort of system. I'm in the up country through the, uh, this thing. you can see the, uh, yeah, please. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Now, a couple of things. When you do a World Bank report to look at the carrying capacity, yes. Uh, the results of that report. Do you share that with yes, other yes. banks? Yes. With the other banks? Uh, because it's not, because no. when anybody invests and does any shrimp yeah, farming, the, they would go to local banks to borrow. Yeah. So if the local banks are aware of carrying capacity limitations, yeah. the likelihood of that extensing finance not yeah. coming through so, would mean such projects don't yeah. happen so that yeah. you don't have escalation and collapse, which yeah. is what I see yeah. here. So, so the, I mean, for the sustainability, your proposal is very important. Um, so, so far, what we have done is we have produced the report and given it to NEDDA, right? And we are at the moment preparing a synthesis report because that uh, the, uh, um, so uh, then I, that will be more useful for uh, you all. And uh, I think uh, that's a good suggestion even I look My like observation it. always is that there is a huge wealth of talent in Sri Lanka who have incredible knowledge. The problem is your knowledge is in pockets. You produce a report, it goes to some government yeah, which yes, sits on a shelf true, true. and nobody ever does anything. And especially in the government sector. Especially that in the government sector. So that was one thing. The second question I wanted to ask you is you make no reference whatsoever to carbon. Now wetlands are an incredible carbon sink. Yeah. Now, rather than trying to say, okay, now we desperately need export dollars, so we let's chop down all our mangroves, let's do shrimp farming, let's do something this, why not look at the opportunity, a more holistic look at, if this environment was left undisturbed, mangroves would remain as carbon sinks. The, the, your soil sediment would remain a carbon yeah, sink. Yeah. The government would get paid without having to do anything. Yeah. Yes. Why is it that that is not explored? That, that has to be sort of, I mean, yeah, I also agree with you because this aspect is there, but uh, uh, especially the, the current trend, any future uh, expansion in the increase in the food production, it has to come from aquaculture. But, but you know, there are other ways of tackling this problem. Say, for example, inland fisheries. There's a section uh, called uh, culture based capture fishery. Correct. So that has to be promoted. But I mean, and also, and it is more cheap, meat. relatively more cheap. Yeah. And uh, but uh, the, uh, the, that's what uh, we are sort of uh, at the moment because you need not to use feed. The natural feed is used in those and a um, lot of benefits, sociological benefits for the Correct. farmers and the people in the area. So in future, I think uh, that is the option we have to go for increasing the fish production in Sri Lanka, not the culture base. 
<laughs> and I think also there is the possibility yeah. of lab grown meat. Yeah, sorry. We're running short of time, so thank you very much. Sorry about that. Feel free to engage him after. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Dr. Malik has been helping us a lot. You just spoke of Dr. Malik. I'd <laughs> like to call upon Dr. Malik Fernandez to please hand over a token of appreciation to Professor Jai Singh for his talk. Please do join us uh, at, at the rear of the hall for tea and some refreshments and as always some fellowship. Thank you. Good evening.